When I got up this morning, I just had to thank God that he had saved me from my sins, that I have been declared righteous and am a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. And now we live in Him, we move in Him, we have our being in Him, and we're waiting for Him. You ought to help me praise Him. Now, Lord Jesus, we come to this part of the, our gathering where we pull ourselves in and we hover and we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks truth. Your word is truth. I pray today that as the Spirit opens our understanding, that you will cause every one of us to request that you speak to us <clears throat> clearly, plainly, and may we apply it and obey it. I just have to pray it again publicly, Lord. This is an impossible task, this thing called preaching. You are taking someone who is fallible and prone to error, and you have required me to speak what you would say. So I can only implore you, Lord, to help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me to be honest and truthful and sensitive and gentle, yet bold as I declare the whole counsel of God. In the name of the risen Jesus, we pray. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to join me in Luke chapter 12. I say again, I am so thrilled to be saved. I don't ever want to take this for granted. God's been good to me. I'm already on my way to heaven. Right now, I'm on my way to heaven. Right now, there's a place prepared for every one of us in heaven. And with all of that, it must be realized that there is a great responsibility that accompanies salvation. You don't just get saved and then float. God saves you by grace, through mercy. We are saved by faith. We enter into his rest. Jesus did it. He finished it. But then the same writer says, now labor to enter into that rest. You are saved to work and endure and pray and witness and praise and bear fruit every day of your life. So we're going to one of the parables of the good Lord in Luke chapter 12, beginning with, it's coming, I know it is, verse 41. Join me. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will 
shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For to everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. <laughs> Pretty strong, isn't it? I don't see you jumping up and down now. <laughs> you may be seated. <clears throat> Let me say this before I even get to the message. Whoever you live for on earth, you will live with in eternity. Did you get that? All right. Well, thank God for this servant. The Lord said, uh, a faithful and wise servant, doing his job, being committed and faithful, he will make ruler over his household. Oh, blessed is that servant. When his master comes, will find him so doing. Truly, he will make him ruler over all that he has. That's a wonderful declaration. That is uh, our Lord lauding someone who was faithful to do what they were called to do. And that's our objective. That's our goal is to be faithful in all that the Lord has called us to do. But when you come to the 45th verse, things suddenly change. Now, the servants haven't changed. It's the same servant. Notice that. The same servant. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master will come when he's not looking. Let's talk about that for a moment. As time passes and God's word becomes clearer that in the last days there will be mockers saying where is the promise of his coming. There's more debate over last day events now than ever. People are arguing about this sign or that thing and some have concluded that uh, the Lord is not coming. He's certainly not coming to catch us away in a rapture. He's certainly not coming before the earth gets fixed by the church. So there's a lot of controversy. And it's possible that the same servant that was on fire for Jesus could now be waning in faith and endurance and start saying right along with the crowd that's backsliding, my Lord delays his coming. He's not coming now. Things aren't right. I don't want to think about this right now. It's just amazing how what's in our hearts will come out when we get impatient and when things don't happen the way we thought they would when we thought they would. That's quite a change of heart. He's saying within himself now, I don't see things the way I used to. I'm not, as, I'm not as vigilant as I was. There are things to be done. Life's got to go on. And he says, that servant is doubting the return of his master. And he begins to eat and drink and be with drunkards. Uh, you can read the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 24. And I notice the first thing that happens to this servant is that he becomes violent. He is so frustrated that a heat of rage that he has, that he has kept under is now coming to the surface. He begins to beat people, violently treat people. Even his other servants... I sat at my desk and thought, why would he suddenly start beating on his servants, people just like him? What has turned this man into such a, 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 a raging maniac? But I've seen it today, and I'm watching it today. I'm watching Christians turn on Christians. I'm watching violence come out of the deepest parts of their hearts. 
And some of it is because they disagree with them. You're not on the same page as I am. And, and as I said last Sunday, in these days, people don't just disagree. They get angry. They want to fight. They become militant about what they believe. And if you don't believe it, something is wrong with you. And that kind of anger will eventually cause you to turn on people. Yes, even other Christians. Not only was this servant now found to be violent, but he became loose in his morals, eating and drinking, and as Matthew said, hanging, hanging around with drunkards. Instead of listening to his master's words and recalling the promise that he would come back, he is now listening to the crowd around him. He is soaking in their attitudes, taking it into himself, the things that they feel, their loose morals, their inability to control themselves, speaking anything, doing anything without any control whatsoever, an irritable lifestyle, a chip on the shoulder, an anger in the heart, and it's the same servant. And it's because he stopped thinking about his master's word, his master's promise to come soon, that he turns into somebody else. I want to tell you something, church. I'm, I'm not a young man anymore. I look it, but I'm going to tell you some things that I've learned. <laughs> when you become impatient, it will eventually lead to disobedience and doubt. And those things will eventually lead to sinful acts. I draw your attention to Exodus chapter 32. This is when God had already delivered them from Egypt, brought them across a Red Sea, given them bread from heaven, given them water out of a rock, and now God's man Moses has been called up to receive the commandments from the Lord. Nobody knew how long he was going to be up there. But as the people thought he might come back this afternoon or maybe in the morning, but that didn't happen. They thought, well, maybe tomorrow afternoon or maybe by the end of the week. They had no idea that God would hold Moses for 40 days. And because they were so impatient, listen, they took things into their own hands. They started thinking their thoughts and figuring out what to do with their lives. Here it is. Listen carefully. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down, when the people saw that Moses was nowhere to be found and there was no evidence that he would be back soon, they took things into their own hands and said to Moses' brother, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. He's gone. He's there. We got to live. We got to carry on our lives. We have to survive. And they found themselves worshiping a God. Now understand this, brothers and sisters. By making a molten calf and worshiping it, they had already broken the first two commandments. You'll have no other God before me, and you shall not make a graven image of me. Two commandments broken already, but here's the sad part about it. Aaron knew better than that. He knew Moses, his brother, was coming back. But because of the pressure of society, Lord, help me not to lose control here this morning. Because of the pressure of society, because of peer pressure, he made the calf, he allowed them to worship, and then said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Tomorrow we're going to all come and stand in front of this golden calf. We're going to worship it, and we're going to dedicate it to the Lord. They took sin and made it a righteous thing. They justified their disobedience. Can you hear me preaching this morning? 
You can't break God's laws and dedicate it to God. You can't live in sin and de dedicate yourself to Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what they did because they became impatient with God. It looked like Moses was never coming down. They declared their sin a feast to the Lord. And, and by the way, can I tell you that on the next page, uh, God said to them, you shall never revile God, nor shall you ever speak evil against your rulers. I wonder if what I said last week registered with anybody. Christians don't believe the Bible anymore. That Bible said you're not to curse a ruler. That Bible said government is from God. Romans 13 said honor those who are in government because God has put them there. And yet Christians in this society standing in front of our own golden calves have found it very easy to get on social media. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> and curse the president, the governor, the congresspersons, the sheriff, the police, when God himself said, don't you dare do that, you'll bring a curse on yourself. Well, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of the same kind of anarchy and chaos that the children of Israel were in. It looks like the Lord's never coming back, so we're just going to take things into our own hands. We'll disregard the commandments of the Lord. We'll do what we have to do to survive and still praise Him as though everything is all right. You know why God had them in that wilderness to start with? He was testing them. Do you see that delays and prolonged waiting brings out what is in us? <clears throat> Let me say it again. Delays, prolonged waiting brings out what is really in us. <clears throat> Now, I've heard the term COVID till I don't want to hear it anymore. And I've heard tests till I really don't want to hear the word anymore. And we know what's going on. We're being tested to find out what's in us. They, those of you that have had the test, they take a swab and you cram it up your nose and you almost cry yourself to death and then you bring it out and then they let you know a little while later whether or not you are infected. Is that right? The testing is to find out what's in you. Don't you dare think for a moment that this testing is only about something in your nose or in your body. God has set up a test for this society today and he's testing what's inside of us right now. And I'm sorry to tell you that lots of Christians have been found infected. You've been found infected with anger and malice and hatred and prejudice and all of those things that the Bible condemns. You've been found to be guilty of criticizing and damning the leaders of this nation. And you think you're okay? You think you can just wander around and this doesn't affect anybody? Let me tell you what a bad attitude does. Let me tell you what sin in a Christian's life does. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I don't care how much scripture you quote or how many times you go to church. If you have bitter envy in your heart and if you are angry in your soul, God is going to bring it out and he has brought it out. And the thing that just baffles me to no end that Christians who do this are dedicating themselves to the Lord in the midst of their doing. Brothers and sisters, God is testing the church and look what's coming out. Violence. Passions. Ungodly passions. Uncivil passions. Unbridled tongues. This is going on in the church. I'm not even thinking about the world. It's lost its mind. This is what's going on 
in the walls of the church in this country today. And I'm just going to tell you exactly how I feel right now. This country would not be in the mess it's in if the churches had done what they were supposed to do. We would not be in this dilemma if preachers had been preachers instead of fake politicians and wannabe political leaders. If preachers had not been weak to give in to the peer pressure of the thinking of the people in the pews, we would not be in this mess today. Churches don't pray. They do not have prayer meetings. Pulpits are full of speeches and discussions about prosperity, about injustice, about self-improvement. When God's Word was supposed to be preached, not our problems, but God's solution. We were supposed to be listening to what thus saith the Lord. And all the while we're waiting on him to come back. We should have been on our knees in prayer. The word of God should have been preached. We should have been walking in the spirit. We should have guided our lives by faith. We should have hidden the word of God in our hearts. But we didn't do it. And now we're suffering the consequences of it. And I want to tell you what, that when these things are neglected in the church, society loses control. Society becomes violent. Society will hate authority and speak insanity and talk of insurrection. For example, defunding the police. Who in their right mind Who in their right mind? Don't even say you're a Christian when God is the one that put the police. Now, we all know this. There are bad apples in every group. Why do I even have to say it? Shame on you for making me say it. Every organization has bad people in it. But God set up government. Satan hates government. That's why you're watching the spirit of lawlessness come into our society ever more strongly right now. The Antichrist is standing in the wings, my brother. And while the anarchists and the rebels and the impatient people are spreading their venom and their poison and talking of overthrowing and tearing down and doing away with the guards and the boundaries that God set up, Santa Christ, the Antichrist is just straightening his tie. He's about ready to step on the scene of action. But you better know this too. He can't get here till the trumpet sounds and God takes us out of this place. <laughs> Say amen, somebody. <laughs> Folks, that's crazy. We, this world's crazy. This nation is crazy. Defund the police department. I don't even know what to say. It's so stupid. Except that it's lawlessness. If we don't pray, if we don't obey, if we are not constantly looking for Jesus to come, I'm telling you, brothers, when we forget that the master said, I will be back, he didn't say when, but he said, I will be back. We'll start doing what the Israelites doing at the foot of the mountain or we're doing at the foot of the mountain. Brother, when we don't live expectantly and obediently, bad things happen. I'm going to make you a little uncomfortable here for a moment. Because I know in the old days when you went to church, you expected to get convicted. That's what preachers did in the old days. Not today. We always want to feel better when we leave than when we came. Some, sometimes God doesn't want you to feel better. 
God wants you to be convicted. Now, I, I'm going to, this is parenthetical here. I think it was Tuesday afternoon. I was praying. And I had something hit me in my gut that scared me. Because as I was skimming through Hebrews, I noticed how many times it said, if. If. And I got a little uneasy. We are made partakers of Christ if we obey. Then I started going through the other epistles of Paul, and I was amazed at how many times he said, you are saved and chosen and called if you continue to walk in my word. And all of a sudden, I got nauseous, physically sick. And I said, oh, my God. Huh. Have I... Have I been guilty of judging my own self instead of letting the Word of God judge me? Because when I start judging myself, I get loose. I, I'll let myself get by with stuff. But if I let God's Word judge me, He keeps me corralled. Do you hear me? He keeps me contained. I don't beat the male servants and the female servants and hang around with the drunkards and eat and drink and get drunk. When I let God's word judge me, he gives me a straight and narrow path to walk on. And I tell you, church, I went through one book after another, and there's only one book in the New Testament that doesn't tell me to fear or be reverent or endure or fight, or hang on. It's the book of Philemon. But I am told in God's word, you better lay hold on eternal life. Walk in the truth. Be severe on yourself. Guard your heart. Bridle your tongue. Vomit out the anger. Get rid of the irritability. Be done with the social divisions that are now tearing up the church. And this is what I found. There are people who, according to Scripture, depart from the faith. How? Because they start listening to deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. See, the devil has doctrines too. And these people that start listening to deceiving spirits, not a doubt in my mind that I've got church members that have done that. And doctrines of devils, and when you listen long enough, you depart. That means you abandon the faith. Did you know that you can cast off your first faith? I was stunned because I read the scripture so many times, but it never hit me before. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 12, Paul is talking about the, the younger women who are single. They cast off their first faith because they've let their passions get out of control. They've become idle. They've become busybodies. They've become gossips. Did you hear that? They were serving the Lord, but because they got loose morally, because they talked constantly, criticized frequently, Paul said now they've cast off their first faith. Did you know you can deny the faith? James said, if a man won't take care of his family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And there are men sitting in church pews right now or will today who have families they are not taking care of, child support they're not paying, wives and children they're not helping. They brought babies into the world, but they are not taking care of those babies. They think because they're in church now, they're somehow freed from that responsibility. This is not easy, is it? <laughs> I'm having to preach it, though. You ought to be where I am right now. 
Because I know that great big churches are, are, are a nice place to hide in when you're living in sin. When you know you're not taking care of your familial or domestic responsibilities, you can go to a big church and get in a prayer group and go on all kinds of missions trips and still be in sin, hiding in the crowd, but denying the faith. Paul even says you can make shipwreck of your faith by going against your conscience all the time when the sweet Holy Spirit is whispering to you and you constantly go against it. He said, you have made shipwreck of the faith. Shipwreck's not good. There's no, there is nothing good about a shipwreck. Everything is lost. And he even mentioned two men, Hymenaeus and there was one others. And he said, these guys have made shipwreck of their faith and I've turned them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Blaspheme, yeah. You know what blasphemy is? It's speaking irreverently about holy things or lightheartedly or in jest about God and the things of God. Do you realize how close so many churches and Christians are to blasphemy today? When we can joke about holy things, divine things, when we take the word of God lightly, when we see church as just another fellowship group. Oh, my brother, that's why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching. If the master is coming back, then every one of us ought to be on our face at some point saying, deliver me from an irreligious or irreverent attitude towards you. Teach me to tremble in your presence. Teach me to live by your word. Teach me to walk in prayer. Let me have a trembling in my soul for the things of God. God is not my buddy. God is not my valet. God Almighty is the creator of all things, and he holds my life in his hands. He is God. And I want to read one to you. This one got me yesterday because, again, I've read it so many times, but I didn't really see it. Did you know you can stray from the faith? Watch this. Verse 20 and 21, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Listen now. Oh, Timothy, and in my Bible there's an exclamation point there. Oh, Timothy, exclamation point. Guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. You know what I hear him saying there? Timothy, at all costs, of our, avoid all the political fighting, all the political discussions, all of the things that take your mind off Christ. Ask yourself this week, what has most of my conversation been about? I, I'm asking myself, what have I thought about most this week? And that ought to give you some small indication of what a revival we need in the body of Christ. Paul said, if you don't avoid it at all cost and guard what God has committed to you, it's possible to stray from the faith. Can you hear me, church? Can you hear me? This is not a game. Church is not a club. This is the assembly of the firstborn. When we come together, there ought to be a, a sense of holiness about us. The presence of an almighty God amongst us. We ought to tread softly and speak carefully because this is the body of Christ. This is the work of the Lord. This is the result of an old rugged cross and an empty tomb. And God does not take what he's done for us lightly. Neither should we take what he's done for us that way. We ought to be holy and reverent in all that we do and all that we say every day of our lives. My Bible says, be diligent. 
Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness and be led by the error of the wicked. Led away by the error of the wicked. Did you hear that, church? I, I really I feel like I've thrown a really cold, wet blanket on everybody this morning. The music was so good, so inspiring. But you see, brother, this is the word of God I'm preaching. I cannot take a pen knife and cut some of it out because it might disturb you. I'm supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. If it makes you nauseous, if it makes you fall on your face, at least it will get your attention and help you to remember the master of the house is coming again. Blessed is that servant that when he comes, he finds so doing. While some abandon the faith and some stray from the faith and some cast off their faith, Paul said, I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I have lived the way the Bible or the way the Lord has told me to live. I have looked for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have expected him to come every day of my life. See, brother, sister, when you don't live with the thought that at any moment you could step into eternity, when you think any time you have plenty of time, when you think you no longer need to be on high alert or be watching expectantly or be waiting eagerly, then your faith withers. And about that time, you find yourself ready to beat up some servants. Hey, what does it matter? You go and you get drunk. You lose control. You forget your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But I can't stop this message until I Read again that verse of Scripture in Luke chapter 12. The master of that servant will come in a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two. Now that doesn't mean literally take a sword and cut him in two. It's a euphemism, a Hebrew or, an, or even an oriental euphemism. You'll get cut off from the source, cut off from the body and you will be appointed with the unbelievers what's good about that unbelievers go to hell but if that servant that at one time was sure and strong and prayerful becomes lax and loose and worldly he will find himself appointed with the unbelievers i'm going to stop there See how deathly quiet it is? Yeah. May God's Holy Spirit do what we ask Him to do this morning. I would not let this day pass. You hear me? I wouldn't let this day pass without going into a private place to pray and saying to Him, Search me, O God. Try me and see if there is any wicked way in me. Oh, God. Stand with me, please. I am going to make a bold statement. In my heart, in my heart, I believe that there are people who have sat on these pews for years who have abandoned the faith. In my heart, I believe there are people who sat in these services who have strayed from the faith. Something has so consumed them other than Christ. Something has so upset and stirred them other than the coming of the Lord that all of their attention now is on something in this world rather than the world that is to come. They are standing at the base of the mountain and saying, we don't know when Moses is coming back, but we don't have time for all that. Let's get on with it. Let's fix it ourselves. Let's correct the country with our mouths and on social media. 
Let's destroy anybody that doesn't believe the way we believe. And they have cast off their first faith. I believe it. I laid on the floor the other day and I pondered. How can it be that in a church like this, and if you're visiting, I preach this way all the time. This is not new. How can it be that people can sit under the truth like this and then suddenly be so stirred and enraged and inflamed by what's happening out there that they don't kneel before the Lord and be reminded, I don't belong to this world. I'm passing through. I'll be gone before long. Or the master is coming back. If you're going to clap, do it right. Everything I do now, I do with the coming of the Lord in mind. I have become obsessed with eternity. Brother, this will be over soon. I said it yesterday to somebody. There's a thin membrane between time and eternity. And you're going to pop through it. And you don't know when. It behooves you to get right with God. Forget about Washington, my God. Forget about Raleigh. Forget about all this mess. Get your mind on Jesus. Look up. Lift up your head. Your redemption is about to draw nigh. Does this make sense to anybody? Can't have an altar call, so we'll just pray. Father, I ask you today to take what was heavy and break what has become hard. Tear apart what has grown together. Deliver us from our worldly thoughts. Forgive us for our violence way down inside. The church has truly failed the test. We've been impatient and now our actions are exhibiting it. I ask you, Lord, start with me, Loran Livingston. Start with me right now, Jesus. Turn the spotlight on me and show me everything that you're still not pleased with. And give me the hunger to make it right so that I may be presented before you without spot and blameless. Is, is there another church person that will say the same thing? Lift your hand. Let me ask you another question. How many of you honestly, truly believe Jesus could come at any moment? Do you? Then we ought to be living like it. Don't you agree? <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Help us to be like that servant when his head was on right, when his heart was right. He served you faithfully. Oh, God, let every one of us be able to say, I have served the Lord. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. And yes, I have kept the faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the whole church said amen. amen. All right. When we dismiss, I'm going to ask you to hurry because I preached too long and people are trying to get in. See you tomorrow night at 7. Let the words of my mouth and the